Good afternoon. I'm Mireya Solis, Senior Fellow at Knight Chair in Japan Studies at Brookings, and it's my pleasure to moderate this panel this afternoon. I think uh, it is very clear that there's a lot of excitement in the room. I think that has come across already through the presentations that we've heard. And uh, this is because, obviously, the big, big success, five years in the making, of having a conclusion at the negotiation stage of the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership trade negotiations. Um, I know this is a Japan-US panel, but I'm going to start with a larger point regarding the significance of this achievement. And that is that the trade regime has not had a success of this magnitude for the past 20 years. The WTO has been unable since its creation to pass through a membership-wide agreement updating the rules on trade and investment. And to be quite frank, many trade experts had reached a stage of despair thinking that the unwieldy trade negotiation agenda, the behind-the-border regulatory matters, were perhaps too complex, too difficult for countries, different countries, to be able to strike a deal. The news in Atlanta last week actually reassured us that's still possible to do that, and we should not lose sight of the consequences of that. I would also point out, again, I'm being a little contrarian, given that this is a U.S.-Japan panel, that the significance of the TPP is that it's not an industrialized club trade agreement. Surely these two countries, the first and third largest economies, are the engines of the TPP. But the fact that you have countries at diverse levels of development coming together in this ambitious trade negotiation, of course, created many uh, headaches during the negotiation, but makes the TPP even more compelling because it shows that it can bring together countries that are very different and still believe there is great benefit in integrating in this manner. Third, the TPP is very important because it's not about creating isolated regions. It is an Asia-Pacific-wide endeavor. And coming from Mexico, I always find myself uh, uh, compelled to remind everybody that it includes many important Latin American economies. It's about bringing Latin America, North America, and Asia together. And last but not least, it's an open platform project. We don't have many trade agreements that from the get-go aspire to get bigger. And we already had a lot of questions about China. There are many other countries that could be potential members down the road, and that is the promise of the TPP, that it can disseminate, that it can grow. It is very important now, going back to the theme of the panel, for U.S.-Japan relations, because it helps these countries advance in core priorities. Think about the rebalanced policy towards Asia of the United States. Think about the strategy of economic revitalization of Japan. These are very important goals for each and also for both countries. Japan has an interest in seeing the United States remain a committed, invested Pacific power. The United States has a strong interest in seeing Japan put behind the period of stagnant growth and deflation. Moreover, I would say the TPP opens a new chapter in U.S.-Japan relations. We already heard it from uh, Kurt Tong. Trade used to be a divisive issue among these allies. Well, with the TPP, we find that the United States and Japan can strike a deal on, yes, of course, difficult, but nevertheless, they stroke a deal on market access issues. And they work shoulder to shoulder with very much the shared uh, vision regarding new rules on trade and investment, and they aim to make those global. This is a new chapter, opens many, many possibilities. Now, the reality check. This long list of successes will only materialize if the TPP enters into force. That's the only outcome that matters, if I may be as direct as that, to get it through the critical test of ratification. And it's not going to be easy. I would say fasten your seatbelts, especially in this country, because we're going to have a soul-searching debate on the merits of trade policy. And it's going to happen uh, of course, in a presidential race year. So we have our homework cut out for us. Therefore, we're not really yet in a post-TPP world. There remains much to be done to bring the TPP into reality. Nevertheless, for our conversation today, I would say that the result in Atlanta, the fact that the United States and Japan were able to work closely to bring this all-important trade negotiation, has given us confidence that they can actually do much more. So open new chapters. 
So the way I think about this panel, actually, and I know Matt had a lot of comments about the title, is beyond TPP. What can the United States and Japan do in critical areas? Internet governance, quality for infrastructure, space policy, international economic governance. These are all very important, but frequently it is not our natural instinct to think about these as areas where the United States and Japan act together with a shared vision. And I see that the purpose of this panel, to think through how, when, under what conditions, with what strategies could these two countries move forward their shared interest if they decide to act jointly. And we have an expert uh, panel of uh, speakers, very distinguished speakers that I'm going to introduce very briefly. And I'm going to ask them to uh, make their uh, remarks in the order in which I introduce them. We have very limited time, four critical areas to cover, great experts, and I'm going to ask for discipline in keeping the remarks short, and I apologize for that in advance. So uh, first, Ambassador Daniel Sepulveda, who is Deputy Secretary of State and Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy at the State Department. Todd Harrison, Senior Fellow and Director of Defense Budget Analysis here at CSIS. Kiyoshi Kodera, Advisor to the President of the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, as many of us know it. And Matthew Goodman, Senior Advisor for Asian Economies, Simon Chair in Political Economy, CSIS. So uh, without further ado, let's get to the fun part of the panel and listen to the presentations. Ambassador Sepulveda, please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your words on the TPP. I think it, it is a critical achievement, and it's critically important as, as we move forward to have everyone involved in the dialogue and, and really get to a, to a positive conclusion here with ratification. Beyond trade policy, the relationship with Japan is critical to the United States for a wide variety of issues, uh, not the least of which is the issues related to international, internet, and global communications governance with which we work uh, very closely with, with Japan in a, in a wide variety of spaces. In the multilateral space, we are strong partners at a variety of multilateral forums and negotiations where we work together to ensure that the pres and preserve the decentralized multi-stakeholder system of internet governance. For those of you who don't work in this field, um, the internet grew up organically out of uh, a research project out of the Department of Defense and eventually spread throughout the world, but it was never centrally controlled. It was ne and to this day, is isn't centrally governed. And it, there are a diffuse uh, group of institutions that ensure that the internet continues to work as a technical matter, so the Internet Engineering Task Force, ICANN, regional internet registries, and others uh, work to ensure that that happens. And then laid on top of that are all our national and international laws that apply to wh whomever is operating on the internet. But our goal has been to ensure that there isn't uh, an effort or a successful effort made to centralize control over global communications into a single regulatory body at the United Nations. On the other side of that argument is Russia and China. Uh, Japan has been a stalwart ally for us, uh, some of the most disciplined negotiators I've ever had the opportunity to work with, uh, some of the hardest working people I've ever had the opportunity to work with. We've had a number of successes over the last two years uh, at the ITU Plenipotentiary, which is the, the main governing body of the specialized body of the United Nations that governs telecommunications. We were able to work together to preserve uh, the open internet as a platform for innovation and growth. We worked together at an event called Net Mundial, which the Brazilian government brought together the developing world with the developed world across sectors, including civil society, ac academia, and the technology community to reaffirm and reinstate our commitment to uh, the multi-stakeholder process of decision making for the internet. And we hope to work together, and we know we will work together with Japan as we move into a discussion in December at the UN General Assembly Looking back at the last 10 years of internet governance and the information society uh, and what we can do to ensure that the information society is made accessible to everyone in the world, uh, the developing world and the developed world alike. Uh, it's a critical conversation and a lot of the political debates um, that will be brought to bear, again, will require uh, the alliance of the United States, Japan, and others to ensure that we are promoting and preserving what we believe is the democratizing force of, of the internet. 
As we move forward, uh, the government of Japan is hosting the G7 uh, in 2016, and they will hold, host a G7 ICT ministerial, and we're working closely with them on that initiative. We're also working closely with them on an initiative uh, just recently announced by the Secretary of State, John Kerry, called Global Connect. And Global Connect will be an effort across both government, about across stakeholders, across governments, NGOs, development banks, and everyone working in the space to try to connect people to the internet to add 1.5 billion more people to the internet by 2020. As you know, uh, today there are 3.2 billion people connected to the global platform, which means that there are three to four billion people who are not. And the degree to which we are able to continue to preserve commitment of the world to having an open and flat internet uh, which has the, the freedom of expression, freedom of association, and freedom of, of creation and commerce uh, underpinnings that exist today is to ensure that everyone gets connected to the platform. It's in our interest and it's in their interest and, and uh, I'm very happy to say that the Secretary has taken personal lead on this issue and, uh, and Under Secretary Novelli as well is, is working on it uh, very diligently. Um, so with that, uh, I will actually just turn over the mic. Um, again, I, I want to reemphasize that we've had many, many, many negotiations over the last two years where there are really only a couple of people awake at the end of it. Uh, I mean, where we go late into the night conducting negotiations and people who don't leave the table are the Japanese. The United States doesn't leave the table either. You're not gonna exhaust us into consensus. And, uh, and uh, you can't do that to the Japanese either, and we very much appreciated uh, their alliance and hard work. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I feel kind of like the uh, outlier on this panel, because uh, I'm not an expert in uh, foreign policy or economics or trade. Um, but what I came to talk about is space. Uh, and how our global economy, not just the U.S. economy or the Japanese economy, but indeed the global economy, is increasingly dependent on satellite-based, uh, space-based capabilities. Uh, everything from satellite imagery that's used for environmental monitoring, for farmers understanding, uh, you know, how their crops are doing, where they need to water their fields. Uh, of course, there's satellite communications um, that, you know, uh, allow us to span the Pacific Ocean and all the way around the world, uh, and uh, satellite-based navigation and timing, and you know we're all more dependent on that than I think we even realize. I would not have made it here on time today uh, were it not for satellite-based navigation, which makes things like Uber possible, uh, which safely delivered me here a few minutes ago. Uh, and you know we've all got space-based capabilities in our pocket or purse today. Uh, and so much uh, of what we do, we may not realize it, is dependent on space-based capabilities. Even uh, large parts of the internet, uh, the timing uh, that they rely on, the common precision timing comes from space-based capabilities, GPS. Uh, and as we have this increasing dependence uh, on space, it also creates a growing vulnerability, an economic vulnerability, but also a security vulnerability. Uh, there are a number of risks to space systems. Uh, of course, when we think about risks to our space systems, you know, um, I have a military background. My mind, of course, immediately turns to uh, military uh, type risks, such as attacks against our space systems. It's easy to think about attacks as, uh, as being kinetic, uh, as sh shooting down a satellite. Uh, something to that effect, but those the kinetic attacks are not the only risk. Uh, there are also non-kinetic forms of attack, cyber intrusions, electronic attacks, things like jamming uh, that can disrupt our space-based capabilities. Uh, but it's not just intentional uh, risk, uh, intentional attacks against our system that pose a risk. It's also the threat of accidents. We have an enormous amount of space debris. Uh, right now, and a, quite a large number of satellites as well. Uh, today, more than 50 nations uh, own or operate satellites. Uh, we've got about 1,265 operating satellites in orbit right now. We've got tens of thousands of pieces of debris that are large enough, uh, large enough for us to track, and right now we can track objects that are about this size, a little bit larger than your hand. Um, and we estimate that there are hundreds of thousands of pieces of orbital debris uh, that are too small for us to track, uh, but soon we'll hopefully be able to, things that are about the size of a golf ball uh, or larger. Uh, and what that means is that any one of our satellites uh, could be struck by uh, some of this orbital debris, and sometimes 
uh, satellites hit each other by accident. Uh, that happened back, I believe, in 2009. Uh, we had an uh, Iridium satellite, a U.S. communications Iridium satellite, uh, struck a defunct uh, Russian satellite, uh, produced an enormous amount of debris. Uh, we also had the Chinese anti-satellite test uh, back in 2007 uh, that also produced an enormous amount of debris. Uh, and so uh, now we're facing uh, a world where this shared resource, uh, the shared economic resource of space uh, is becoming uh, increasingly difficult to operate in. Um, so what can we do and where are the opportunities here for partnership? I think uh, between the, Japan and the United States, there are a number of great areas uh, where we could partner uh, to advance both of our uh, interests in space. Uh, one is an improved space stewardship. And we've already made some strides in this area in terms of data sharing uh, of objects we're tracking in space uh, so we can avoid collisions in the future. But I think the next step really is to go beyond just data sharing and actually launch some joint missions. Uh, the best way to track space debris is actually not on Earth. You need to be up in space where you're closer to the debris so you can see smaller items. Uh, the U.S. has a program uh, to put space-based space space surveillance satellites uh, in geosynchronous orbit. I would love to see the U.S. and Japan collaborate on some of these systems to put uh, space surveillance satellites in orbit together. Um, there's also the issue of on-orbit servicing. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the vast majority of satellites, once you launch them, you can never service them. Uh, they eventually will run out of fuel uh, or something, will, uh, something else will break on the satellite and it will cease to operate. Hopefully you've been able to move it to a parking orbit by then, but sometimes you haven't been able to. Uh, and so one of the big advances, I think, in space stewardship would be developing the capability to service these satellites on orbit. Now, we've done some of this with the space shuttle in the past, but of course we've retired the space shuttle. Uh, and that was only in low Earth orbit. Uh, and some of our most valuable satellites are in geosynchronous orbit, a much higher orbit uh, where it's not really fit for human space travel. Uh, so DARPA, uh, among other agencies, are working on uh, systems to do on-orbit servicing of satellites. I think that would be another great area of partnership between Japan and the United States. And Japan has actually made some uh, strides towards developing a debris mitigation technology, something like a magnetic uh, trolling net uh, that could go through space and help clean up small pieces of debris, that is another area uh, where we could see some joint collaboration that would advance uh, our shared interest. On the military side, uh, there are a number of things we could do together. Uh, one is uh, Japan is already in the process of launching their own uh, GPS uh, augmentation system known as QZSS. Uh, and that will help improve coverage, GPS coverage uh, over Japan and that part of the Pacific. Uh, one of the things we could partner on there is including uh, uh, one of the military uh, signals on those Japanese satellites. So we have this new military signal uh, the U.S. has developed called the M-Code. Uh, and that signal used by the military is much more resistant to jamming and spoofing. Uh, and so it helps protect you from some of those non-kinetic threats I talked about earlier. Uh, that's something that the U.S. and Japan uh, could work on. Also, enhancing missile warning uh, information, uh, such as using a hosted payload on other Japanese satellites to host a missile warning payload. Uh, the U.S. has done this with a commercial provider before. We've done a commercially hosted infrared payload for missile warning. Uh, that's another area of potential collaboration with Japan. Uh, and, of course, in uh, protected military satellite communications. Uh, and when I say protected, I mean protected against jamming. Uh, the U.S. military uh, is in the process of launching its advanced DHF constellation uh, of satellites for protected uh, communications for the military. Uh, again, we could take a hosted payload version of advanced DHF and host that on a Japanese satellite. Uh, that would not only bring Japan into our network, uh, our military network of protected communications and enhance our military, uh, joint military capabilities and our interoperability, uh, but also uh, it would help build out the U.S. constellation uh, over the Pacific. So I, I've, I've thrown out a bunch of different areas here of how we could jointly cooperate both on the civil side, on the military side, in space programs. Um, 
But you know, the, the bottom line is, you know, why Japan? Why the U.S.? Why should we be the ones cooperating together here? And I think it's because we really have shared economic and security interest in space. Um, you know, a, as some of the largest economies on Earth, uh, I think it is uh, in our uh, mutual interest uh, to uh, work in this area, uh, not only to enhance the resilience of our, uh, of our space systems, but also to deter aggression. Uh, to make it more difficult uh, or less valuable uh, for a, a rogue actor in space uh, to try to uh, disrupt some of these space-based capabilities. Um, so I think these are areas in which we can, you know, together promote the peaceful use of space and economic prosperity uh, for all. Uh, and uh, not to mention, uh, we both have pretty robust industrial base uh, uh, in this area in terms of space technology. So this is a way that we can leverage uh, both of our country's uh, industrial bases uh, for this joint effort. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm so happy to be here because uh, probably later, uh, late last year, uh, when President Hamlet came to Tokyo over the dinner, uh, he asked me, uh, he said that, may, uh, he suggested that I should come here to talk about the Japanese uh, development policy. And uh, here I am, but uh, in a bit of a different context. US Japan should be there. And uh, the, the ambassador Tone uh, talk about the small history the short history of the uh, U.S.-Japan economic relationship. Uh, when, when I first came to this town uh, back in 1982, I was immediately dragged into the uh, yen dollar talk uh, to open up the Japanese finance market. And uh, that was really tough time. By the way, uh, then I was in the finance section and Ambassador Sasae was in economic section. And since then, uh, after all, I lived in this city uh, for altogether 15 years, uh, embassy and the World Bank, and I really enjoyed the, the, the uh, stay here. But coming back to the uh, U.S.-Japan uh, relationship, particularly on the development finance, uh, think about not everything is uh, sort of the fight, and uh, we have to. Uh, we did have uh, lots of uh, common interests. Uh, first, late 80s. Latin American debt. Uh, we work so closely with the U.S. Treasury to come up some uh, plan. And uh, back in the 87, Miyazawa plan was conceived, uh, which includes some of the debt reduction for the uh, commercial debt uh, to the Latin American countries. And uh, later, it became Brady plan. And uh, back in Tokyo, I was a part of the team uh, who is uh, drafting the uh, uh, press release for Secretary Brady. So th those were the days. And then comes 90s. Uh, the, we really worked together uh, for assisting the country in the former Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe uh, for their market transition. And uh, in this century, early part of the century, uh, this century, we both, uh, both of us uh, worked very hard to, uh, the, for the economic reconstruction of the Afghanistan. So we talk about Asia and uh, infrastructure, uh, but we have so much in common. Uh, even now, uh, we are really helping the uh, refugees and its, its surrounding country uh, of the Syria. Uh, we just committed the uh, 370 million for Turkey to assist to, to, to build their municipal infrastructure, which is already overcrowded by uh, refugees from Syria. And uh, we are contemplating on the budget support to Iraq. Uh, the many Middle Eastern uh, country is now uh, the, the one of the biggest uh, client to, to JICA. Now, coming back to the a recent Japanese policy. As you know, the, uh, earlier this year, we announced a new development uh, charter, uh, which is for the first time since 2003. Uh, it has a lot of elements with uh, secu human security as a, a principal guideline, inclusive, uh, sustainable, and the resilient growth as a, a major target for, the, uh, for the, the, the poverty reduction, and the articulation of the better partnership bilaterally and multilaterally. 
And do you know that recently uh, we are really pushing the quality infrastructure? Uh, back in May, uh, Prime Minister Abe has announced the uh, 110 billion package, and uh, out of which uh, probably JICA, JBIC will do the, the half of the funding. But we need a private sector. Uh, the PPP, uh, it's uh, still the kind of panache, and we need a strong back sort of the institutional build up in the developing country, uh, starting from Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, all the way to the Latin American countries. And here, uh, we have a good uh, the, the venue to, to collaborate more. And I know that, that the USAID has been doing so much uh, the, uh, the important things to improve the governance of the public utility institution in uh, Latin America, the, the, the Asia, uh, particularly in Central Asia. And we can combine that activity with with our concessional funding. And uh, uh, the JICA, as of now, we commit annually uh, 9 to 10 billion US dollars. Uh, it's huge, and, and it's also global. So we have a lot of the complementarity role. Uh, after the TPP, oh, I learned it at the transit lounge in the, the Toronto last Monday, and I really applaud it. Uh, the, this is a really good uh, the movement, and uh, also compared to WTO negotiation, this is not the North versus South. Uh, the, uh, us, uh, the U.S. and, and, and uh, uh, Pacific, uh, the limb countries, uh, including Latin America, Peru, uh, Chile, and, and uh, Vietnam. We are equal partners. Uh, this is a sort of the new sort of the uh, ground for the cooperation. And uh, uh, we have to think about something more or the, the innovative. But uh, the basic thing is that we need, do need better investment climate. Uh, we do need uh, uh, the better institution for, for such activities. Uh, the PPP's concept, uh, institutional capacity in individual country needs to be strengthened. Uh, I think we can do uh, uh, much better. Uh, for, for now, part, for instance, we, are, we have been working on the, uh, the SOE, uh, state-owned enterprise reform and the non-performing loan reform uh, in Vietnam. We are struggling, but once Vietnamese take a definitive action. This is good for every TPP participant's country. So that is the, 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 our role. And also, on top of the infrastructure, we have been cooperating with USAID on the global health security uh, uh, the, the issues. Uh, you saw the, the Ebola pandemic, and but uh, who else? Uh, what kind of disease will uh, hit once again in uh, many parts of the globe? And uh, in Vietnam, uh, we have been closely coordinating with USAID how to build up that their uh, global uh, health uh, alliance system. Women and the girls' education is quite important. Uh, this has been talked about uh, when uh, uh, Michelle Obama came to Tokyo and uh, Prime Minister Abe is uh, really putting the, uh, the serious uh, emphasis uh, uh, on the, our gender uh, uh, the, the issues. Uh, safeguard policy on environment and, and the resettlement standard in many aid institutions. Uh, early 90s, uh, U.S. really pushed hard uh, to improve the uh, guideline in the uh, World Bank group, and uh, that is now the, uh, became a normal standard for uh, Japanese aid institutions' uh, activities. And this needs to be maintained uh, quite firmly, because uh, uh, we do need the, the, our projects and, and activities uh, going down to the real benefit of the people or in the field. Uh, life cycle cost, uh, which is a part of the, the important element of the quality infrastructure. And uh, this has been already proposed by some of the American entrepreneurs. And, and uh, we really like to emphasize this uh, life cycle cost rather than uh, the initial uh, the cost. And the people have to be very careful about the operation and the maintenance costs for several years to come. And uh, this also uh, has to do with the most recent procurement reform in the World Bank Group. And the World Bank Group is now working on how we can uh, the, the achieve, improve the procurement policy for the uh, money, uh, value for money. But after all, uh, in the end, I'm more of the multilateral person than the bilateral person. 
Japan, US and Japan is first and second biggest shareholder of the IMF, World Bank, and Asian Development Bank. And we have a lot of say uh, to their governance, and uh, Ambassador Ton talked about the Bretton Woods institution reform, and uh, uh, I was part of the negotiations uh, for the, 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 uh, the share, shifting the, the voting power from the developed country to developing countries, uh, the, which involved 188 countries negotiation back in 2010, uh, together with the uh, Minister Carsten from Mexico. And uh, 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 this, the changes really need to move forward. I, I know the Chinese colleagues' frustration, uh, not seeing the, uh, the, fi the, the implementation of the reform in the IMF, but the World Bank already did it. Uh, so the, we have uh, lots of uh, the common issues, uh, both bilaterally and also at the monetary uh, sphere. Uh, maybe I stop here and uh, uh, leave it to the Marsha. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Koderasan. I actually would like to use my time to uh, ask questions of the other panelists, but I'm, I'm supposed to perform as well here today. I'm actually especially trying to get my head around that giant butterfly net in space capturing golf balls, but, uh, but we can maybe come back to that. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, how the U.S. and Japan work together on regional and global economic governance. So I'll just define that first and then talk about how we have cooperated and how we could going forward. Um, so basically, economic governance is about, you know, running the world, or to be more specific, uh, it means um, contributions to multilateral institution building um, and rulemaking uh, with the aim of providing international public goods, promoting mutual prosperity, and importantly, incentivizing others to play by the rules. So I think this is what I mean, at least, by global economic governance and how the U.S. and Japan work together in that area. Um, the U.S. has been working on economic governance globally uh, since 1944, since it uh, helped establish the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, Japan has been um, actively involved in this since at least 1966, when it proposed uh, the establishment of the Asian Development Bank, by the way, over U.S. objections at the time. Uh, not unfamiliar to uh, recent uh, uh, events, but the U.S. eventually got on board and we've worked very closely together. Uh, Japan also joined the so-called G5, as it were, in 1973, and so became a part of the global uh, economic governance uh, uh, team, as it were. Um, and at that global level, the G5 eventually became seven and then eight and is now back to seven. Uh, let's just call it the G7, because that's what it is today. We have worked very closely together, the U.S. and Japan, on the core agenda in the G7, which is promoting uh, sustainable growth uh, in the world, financial stability, uh, and then in a later period in the G7, uh, development cooperation, as Koderasan mentioned. Uh, Japan, for example, as host of the uh, G7 in 2000, uh, worked very closely with us um, in uh, uh, setting up, what ultimately kicking off what became the Global Fund for AIDS, uh, malaria, and tuberculosis, and Japan was really a champion of that. In the G7, we've also had tension, which has been alluded to over the years, so we haven't always uh, seen eye to eye. A lot of that focus uh, of tension early on was about current account surpluses and Japan's large current account surplus. The U.S. pushed very hard against that, um, but that has largely gone away as an issue um, as Japan's current account surplus has declined significantly. Um, the other issue that's been in contention, alluded to also by others, is uh, U.S. concerns about Japanese currency intervention uh, designed to keep the yen weak. Uh, uh, that, again, is a, a story from the past, uh, not the present. Um, and, but even in the past, we actually did joint intervention together, even during these tensions. Uh, for example, in the Plaza Accord that was alluded to, we had intervened together. Um, post the Fukushima disaster in uh, uh, March of 2011, we intervened together. Um, and more recently, the U.S. and Japan have found common ground in the G7's approach to currency issues uh, when, uh, in 2013, they agreed on language that is now the governing language for currency issues in the G7 and G20, that uh, we will use policies directed at domestic objectives using domestic instruments, and we will not target exchange rates. That was agreed language that benefited both the U.S. and Japan. Um, 
That's right, my glasses have just fallen apart. So if they fall off, I apologize. I'll just have to wing it after that. Um, uh, G20 is another area where the U.S. and Japan have worked very closely in global economic governance. Uh, Post-crisis, we, uh, we played a cl critical role together as the world's still two largest economies, just barely. Japan was still uh, number two in 2008, 2009. Uh, and we worked very closely together in, in developing common uh, parallel stimulus packages, uh, very heavy uh, fiscal stimulus packages in, in that period. Um, we also, and this is little known to history, I had actually forgotten it until a Japanese friend reminded me, because I was involved in the G20 a little bit later, but it was actually the Japanese Sherpa uh, who proposed the idea of a, a standstill on protectionism uh, in the G20, which is a very important, incredibly significant uh, uh, accomplishment of the G20, which gets little attention, uh, but uh, compared to previous points in history when there was a risk of, when we slid into uh, a competitive uh, um, protectionist and, and uh, currency uh, moves, it was, uh, the G20 has made a strong stand against protectionism, honored in the breach, admittedly, but the standstill uh, provision still stands, and that was a Japanese idea. Um, we also worked, when I was doing G20 work as the so-called YAC, uh, the Sherpa's deputy, um, uh, um, on uh, an issue that came up uh, in the G20. The, there was a, 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 a problem with uh, rare earths, uh, exports from China, which were being restricted, and the U.S. and Japan worked to try to get the G20 to speak about this. We didn't, in the end, succeed, but uh, the next year or so, I think 2012, we uh, jointly filed a case with the European Union in the WTO, and uh, we won that case, and it uh, led to a change in Chinese uh, policy. So uh, that leads into the WTO, another area where we have worked very closely together to bring China into the WTO. We were champions of that, the U.S. and Japan, um, and uh, we have worked uh, very closely on a number of issues that we can, um, we can talk more about. I wanted to touch on regional economic governance as well, because that's a r really important part of our relationship as well. Uh, let me start with my favorite institution regionally in the region. You've heard me say this before. I'm one of the few fans of APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, which I didn't mention before uh, when Kurt was here. Kurt Tong was the ambassador to and the senior official in APEC, so we worked very closely together. The U.S. and Japan were founding members of APEC in 1989, and we've been uh, leading champions of that organization. In the years 2010, 2011, we had back-to-back -back host years, and we, um, we initiated something called the, which Kurt labeled the one-two punch uh, of the Japan and the U.S. working together to promote um, uh, APEC standards on um, innovation, on good regulatory practices, on environmental goods. We got a very significant agreement in our year, which was um, uh, predicated on work Japan had done. Uh, we worked together on structural reform. Um, when I was doing APEC in the White House, I asked I think, somebody, Kurt's team, to pre prepare a list of all the things we were trying to achieve in our host year in 2011, and which countries or which economies across APEC uh, were supporting us on which initiatives, and there was a big matrix produced, and you went down the line of all the issues, uh, every single thing we were trying to get done, and Japan had a double check next to it. They totally were supportive and, and in agreement with us, not because we told them to, but because they believed in all these things. So we, we worked very uh, closely together in APEC. Um, TPP is another regional endeavor that's been talked about. Obviously, as a U.S.-Japan FTA, that speaks for itself. Um, has made intrinsic you know, contributions to the regional and global economic order, or will do. Also importantly, in terms of the point I made at the beginning about incentivizing others, uh, and to the question that was asked earlier about, or questions about China's role in TPP, uh, you know, when it, it was when Japan entered TPP in uh, March of 2013 that the view of TPP in Beijing flipped, I'd say about 180 degrees when they had thought this was something uh, designed to exclude them, they realized this is where the rules of uh, regional trade were being written. Now you had uh, the U.S. and Japan uh, working together in this forum to, um, to establish the rules. And I think China then realized it needed to certainly understand what was going on and possibly even participate and join uh, this. So that's an important example. Um, just quickly, the ADB and this Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, I I investment bank that's recently been proposed and is getting up, uh, up and running uh, by China, um, 
again, in the ADB, we've worked very closely together as joint shareholders, uh, leading shareholders in that organization uh, to pr promote uh, the policies the ADB has taken to on poverty alleviation and on infrastructure. Uh, done a lot of, in fact, the majority of ADB lending is actually to infrastructure. Uh, it's a myth about, about the ADB. Um, uh, and, and we've had, but frankly, we've had shared concerns about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, about governance, about lending, about procurement practices, and we've, uh, whether you like the way the U.S. and Japan have handled this, the fact that we've had these concerns and have expressed them uh, well or clumsily, uh, it has had an impact on the way that organization has unfolded, and I think that's very significant. I'm happy to uh, rebut any criticism of that later. Um, and then, and then uh, with Kodera sitting, San sitting here, I'll just say we've done a lot bilaterally with Japan. I mean, we've each done bilateral things in development in particular, which have uh, run in parallel and have helped uh, advance uh, the regional economic order. Uh, for example, right now what we're doing in Myanmar to, uh, in parallel and together is a good example. Afghanistan's another good example, a um, little further afield. Just quickly, in terms of a future agenda, I, it's been alluded to several times that Japan is going to be hosting the G7 in 2016. I think that there, all of the topics discussed here uh, are ripe for uh, further discussion in, in the G20. Uh, but I think the key thing that Japan could do working with um, the U.S. is to try to bridge the growing divide across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, where the U.S. and Japan and Canada are aligned on a number of issues, and the European, the four European members of the G7 seem to be drifting in another direction. Uh, we can talk more about that if you'd like, but I think uh, it is happening in a number of different areas, and I think there's a strong incentive to bring this, the seven back together again, uh, and, um, and I think Japan has a role to play there. The G20, China is going to be hosting starting December 1 of this year for the following year. And I think there the key is for the U.S. and Japan to work together to keep China's eye on the ball on the core G20 objectives of growth, uh, financial stability, and then uh, trade, climate change, uh, infrastructure is another area that, that I think we can work together closely with the Chinese uh, to, to advance those issues. And then finally on APEC, obviously we can use that together to advance uh, TPP, which is designed to be uh, it is open to all APEC economies, including China and Indonesia and others that haven't um, yet uh, chosen to, to join, but uh, we need to figure out how to, how to expand TPP uh, to the whole region. And then I would say I think we should pick two or three issues to really zero in in, um, in, in the Peru year, which is next year's host of uh, APEC and beyond. Infrastructure standards, I think, would be pr possibly one which APEC could be very helpful on. Um, I would also uh, echo something uh, Kurt said in his speech um, about inclusive growth. I think that there's a lot of work that's already being done in APEC on women's empowerment, on uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, on financial inclusion, all of these things together we could be uh, working together to advance. So in sum, uh, the U.S. and Japan share a lot of interests, a lot of capabilities, um, a lot of experience in global and regional economic governance, and there's a lot to build on. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. This has been really quite a treat. We had a set of presentations on such diverse um, issues, and all of them were delivered in such a thoughtful and concise manner. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. And I would like to get started with uh, the conversation, and I have a few questions for the panelists, and then I'll open it up for questions from the floor. Uh, my first question is on internet uh, governance and this uh, specific issue of cross-border data flows and privacy. And, uh, you know, we of course know that recently the European Court of Justice struck down the uh, safe harbor provision. And therefore my question is, uh, what are, uh, if, to the extent that you know, Ambassador Sepulveda, what are Japanese positions regarding the balance between uh, cross-border data flow and privacy, are they closely aligned with what the United States consider to be the right set of uh, provisions? Are there gaps? And uh, given what has happened with the European Court of Justice, can we expect that the chapters on digital economy, say from TPP and TTIP, would be uh, different in key aspects or not? Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's obviously a very timely question. Uh, you know that in the TPP there were strong free flow of data provisions. Uh, to ensure that there's protections against data localization. 
or the desire to uh, construct industrial policies within nations to have your own, essentially, ICT economy. The, those are all good provisions. Japan has been aligned with us uh, in the idea that the whole internet is based on economies of scale. If you can't move data across borders, then the internet doesn't work anymore. It's just a bunch of intranets that may or may not be connected to each other. Uh, so we're, we're aligned in that space. Uh, th the Japanese do have a very pro-privacy culture, as do the Europeans, and as do we. We have fun, but we have do different mechanisms by which to protect and preserve the capacity of individuals to, to protect their privacy and from, from which to protect themselves from unfair or deceptive practices, for example. So what we have right now is, uh, is the court, the European Court of Justice having declared invalid the, the existing safe harbor. We have uh, been engaged in negotiations for our, through our Department of Commerce for a number of years uh, on updates to the safe harbor and hopefully we'll be able to conclude those soon and restore that type of protection for companies engaged in, in transnational border flows. The different countries and different cultures have different perceptions of the relationship between the individual and the rest of society as it relates to privacy, and there are going to be different privacy laws around the world. The, the challenge for us is to ensure that regimes are interoperable. So obviously we have to respect the laws of other nations relative to how their people uh, interact with market actors in that space. And, and uh, the safe harbor mechanism has allowed us to do that uh, between ourselves and, and our colleagues in Europe. But the same can be done through corporate binding rules, uh, through model, model contracts, uh, through multiple other mechanisms. But what we have to avoid is the balkanization, the fragmentation of the internet. And on that point, I think we are all, all of us across the G7 are agreed uh, and across most of the, most of the world. Thank you very much. Um, now, my next question is for uh, both Mr. Codera and uh, Matthew uh, Goodman, and has to do with this theme about reforming the Bretton Woods institutions. And in particular, I'm thinking about the World Bank. Uh, we know that soon after the establishment of the AIB, um, I think that very, in a very, very nimble way, the Asian Development Bank implemented some important changes to expand its lending capacity, to streamline lending decisions, and so forth. And as Mr. Coder was saying, well, Japan and the United States are the first and second largest shareholders in the World Bank, and there is perhaps a need to make this institution more nimble as well. So what are the prospects that there could be some change in that institution? Well, the World Bank has been implement, uh, oh, 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 the, uh, the working on the, uh, uh, the many area of the reforms and in the operational policy, particularly on the procurement. And uh, shareholding issue, uh, when we had agreement in 2010, that review needs to be done this calendar year. But uh, the, there was a paper to the development committee last week, and it's still the starting point. And uh, uh, so the reform in the IMF, which was agreed late 2010, needs to be finalized and being implemented. And this is uh, uh, something to do with the U.S. Uh, the congressional politics, and, and so we have to wait and see. But. Uh, the world is changing, and uh, clearly the uh, more role for emerging economy is, is uh, expected. Uh, but at the same time, the, 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 probably the World Bank and the multilateral development bank really have to devote themselves how to deal with the global public goods. Uh, climate change negotiation is coming uh, the, 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 in, in a month, uh, two months' time. And on top of that, as Mashu talked about, the, the, we have launched the, the Global Health Initiative and the creation of the Global Fund. Uh, but pandemic issue is another challenge. And uh, after Ebola, we have to come up with uh, some you know, uh, the important uh, uh, the institution strengthening for the better the, uh, the, the preparedness. And at the same time, how to involve the financial institution, the banking sector, uh, insurance, and the pandemic is the kind of the natural disaster. You never know when to come, but uh, you can reduce the risk by uh, pooling the, the, those risks uh, through the uh, financial uh, institution. 
Uh, so these ideas is also all, also cooking in the, the World Bank group and the ADB, and and uh, uh, so my bottom line message is that how we can work together uh, to come up with the good scheme idea to bringing the private sector money. I think that Kodera-san has said it very well. I'll just um, uh, highlight one point, which is that. Um, after the 2010 agreement and the G20 to implement the reforms of the um, shares and chairs in the World Bank and IMF, the U.S. and other um, members of the G20 did follow through with the World Bank reforms, and that did lead to a, a shift in shares and chairs uh, in the World Bank, um, and whereas the IMF uh, was not um, done, or it's every other country other than the United States has implemented that. It is stuck uh, in the U.S. Congress, and that's a... Um, a tragedy or beyond uh, that it's stuck there. It, we need to get it done, and uh, it, it makes a huge difference to uh, uh, to the credibility of uh, the United States and of the G20 that we get this done. Um, I would say that once we do that, I think the focus should shift back on the kinds of substantive questions that Koderasan has has mentioned, because there's a big agenda and there's lots to be done. So once we've resolved the issue of how the table is set, we should get back to the agenda and the menu. Get my last question so the uh, audience can weigh in. Uh, Todd, I was blown away by all this discussion about space policy, and I appreciate very much that you made it so understandable for someone that doesn't know anything about uh, the subject. Um, and I think it was crystal clear why the United States and Japan should cooperate and what areas are of promise. My question is how we go about it, how we implement this. What will be the first steps, the baby steps to make this happen? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, there are Probably military to military uh, it would be the, the first logical step. Um, and quite frankly, the, on the U.S. side, that's where the money is. Uh, on the Japanese side, it may be different. Um, but I think that, you know, that's where we can link together um, and, you know, start developing joint programs. And so, you know, to date, a lot of what we do uh, between the U.S. and Japan is sharing of information. Uh, I think the next big step, though, is to have some joint programs where we go out and we actually build some space systems together, launch them, and operate them together. Uh, I think that would be a big step forward in the relationship. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody has been very patient. It's time to uh, raise your questions. Please, if you can raise your hand, wait for the mic, identify yourself, and be super concise because we don't have a lot of time. I'll take three questions at a time. So I'll start with these two and then the gentleman in the back. Uh, Len Brack and Bloomberg BNA. Given your prescience, uh, Mr. Goodman, would you speculate as to when and where the leaders will sign the TPP agreement and when thereafter will the, uh, the agreement be submitted to Congress? And then this lady. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm glad that uh, my name is Paula Stern. Uh, I have my own consulting firm, the Stern Group. Um, uh, I'm glad that uh, women was mentioned um, uh, in the context of, quote, structural reform in Japan, um, because my question really relates to uh, the difficulties every nation are, is experiencing, and that is the specter of continuing slow global gro economic growth. With Japan and the U.S. being um, uh, so incredibly important, uh, and understanding that TPP, when it finally is ratified, might help stimulate, uh, in certain cases, um, uh, the economies, the global economy. Um, I would like, nevertheless, for you to comment on what you think the U.S. and Japan should be doing um, outside of TPP and all the other discussions to uh, tackle, uh, perhaps as agenda item uh, number one, um, the slow growth specter. Um, and certainly before they meet uh, in uh, uh, Japan next year. Thank you very much. And one last question in this round. It's yes. at the, oh, you have it already. Mm -hmm. Mark Mannion with the Congressional Research Service. A question and a comment. Uh, the question is for Todd. Uh, Todd, could you compare U.S.-Japanese cooperation on space issues with, uh, let's say, U.S.-European, U.S.-EU cooperation and the depth, the scope, what kinds of issues uh, uh, that might differ between the two. Uh, and then the comment is, uh, uh, Mireya, you mentioned that um, 
you know, economic issues no longer divide or as, or as divisive uh, between the two governments. And I, I think that's certainly true between the two governments, or at least executive branches. But as I, I know you know, uh, there are plenty of issues that do divide us. And I think if and when TPP comes to Capitol Hill, those are going to be on full display. You're going to hear lots and lots of voices in Congress. Uh, and that won't just be isolated to economic issues. Uh, you know, if President Putin goes to Japan, for example, that's going to become front and center. So basically, whenever you submit a trade agreement of this magnitude, everything that that country does that we're involved with uh, becomes fair game uh, mm -hmm. for, for politicians to, uh, to focus on. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, so uh, maybe we'll go this way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'll start responding to the last question there. Um, you know, cooperation between Japan and the U.S., I think on the civil side, looking at NASA programs, for example, I think is pretty strong uh, and has a good history there, uh, as do uh, our relations with European partners uh, on civil space programs. When you come to military space programs, you do see a stark difference, though. Uh, we have a, a much greater history and a deeper level of uh, engagement with many of our European allies and military space systems. Um, you know, a few things come to mind. Uh, our advanced DHF uh, satellite constellation for protected military communications. Um, from the very beginning of that program, um, our, many of our NATO allies were bought into it and contributed to the program and are, are part of the usage of the constellation. Uh, specifically, I believe Canada, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands uh, all bought into that program from the very beginning. Um, and you know, many of our other space systems as well, the Wideband Global SATCOM, which is just a, a wideband uh, military satellite constellation. Australia is a partner on that, many other nations now. Uh, and so you know, I look at this and I say as part of our pivot to the Pacific, uh, to the Pacific rebalance or whatever the term we're using now, um, it just seems logical to me uh, that we should be trying to foster that level of engagement and involvement uh, in our space programs uh, with Japan and others uh, in the Pacific uh, as we have traditionally had uh, with our European allies. Yeah, let me just, um, uh, when I was a, I've said this before publicly, but when I was a junior economist at the Treasury Department working with Larry Summers, he told me that if you want to be a good economic forecaster, pick a number or a date, but not both. Uh, so, um, so my number is that the that TPP will uh, eventually be signed and will be ratified by all 12 members. I have a high confidence in that. Uh, when, who knows? Uh, but I think that there had been hope it might be uh, signed at APEC next month. That's obviously not going to be possible uh, given the uh, legislative calendar. But, uh, but I would say sometime next year I would expect it to be uh, both signed and ratified. Um, so just uh, you can hold me to that later, but I think it will happen. Um, and then on just the other uh, point, uh, like Mark's point about uh, Japan is still controversial on Capitol Hill, and I think some of those issues will um, will arise in the debate over TPP. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, it's, I think Japan is a, um, suffers from this legacy of um, uh, difficult market access in agriculture and in, in does some industrial goods, especially automobiles, uh, and uh, from this legacy of, of currency, what well, has never been called manipulation, but that's what I think the Hill often calls it. Um, and uh, most of those things are no longer uh, relevant or um, are more in the realm of, uh, of sort of mythology or, or hangover from, from old issues. But some of those issues are still politically very powerful. There's no question that TPP is going to have to show, and none of us have read it, at least I haven't read it, so I am not in a great position to comment on what it does, but I assume it's going to make a, a pretty significant dent in the agriculture market um, uh, questions, and there's going to be a strong constituency wanting to push that. Um, in automobiles, I'm pretty sure we're not going to satisfy the uh, Detroit, but, uh, but Detroit got a lot out of this agreement based on what one hears. I mean, in the sense that we're going to maintain uh, protections in uh, the U.S. market for 25, 30 years, uh, and, uh, and there seem to have been some useful changes in the Japanese market and non-tariff barriers. Um, so we'll see how the debate plays out. Um, I, I don't think, my gut tells me it's not going to be 
a deal killer. It's not going to be uh, uh, the thing that brings TPP down. I think there are going to be broader uh, concerns about trade or politics that are going to, if, it, if, it's, if my prediction is wrong, that's what's going to, going to do the trick. And I just say growth. I totally agree uh, that growth is the number one priority. It's number one, two, and three uh, for the, any of the economic um, bodies that I mentioned or others have mentioned. Uh, how to do it um, is, is the $64,000 question. I think uh, uh, we're going to have to do a number of things. Um, I think fiscal and monetary policy are still part of the answer, but I think structural reform is going to be critical uh, in, in most of our, in all of our economies. Um, and uh, you mentioned women's empowerment. I think that's part of the answer, too, uh, though that's not the only thing about women that is important to talk about, but that uh, is a particular answer because growth is a function of two things, number of people working and, and how productive those people are. And so you got to work on making people more productive, but you also got to get more people into the workforce. Um, and so it's, to me, it's, it's pure arithmetic um, that Japan and other countries are going to have to do something because of their demographic uh, 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 trajectories, which are very gloomy. So stop there. Okay, I ha we have time for two more questions. Uh, this gentleman. Who has the mic? Um, uh, over here in the front. Uh, can you raise your hand again so they can see you? It's right here. Hello, uh, Dan Bosca, CEO of IntelliWings. Uh, just a quick question. It, with the, I know TPP is really big uh, all around the region, but how can small businesses help and uh, promote uh, economic cooperation and security cooperation as part of the whole uh, TPP agreement? Mm -hmm. And then Kikuchi san here. My name is. Um, Kunio Kikuchi with the Washington Research and Analysis. Mr. Kodera, nice seeing you. Uh, used to be with the World Bank at the same time. And uh, my question is this. Um, since uh, Matthew won the sort of prize for saying that there are 37 agencies looking after Japan and US, and I have a computer where when I have too many things on my desktop, I get a reminder saying, do you want to eliminate some of the uh, infrequently used icons? Now, my question is, does the TPP add a few more agencies to this list of 37? And at the same time, is there any efforts to reduce that, especially since it requires a lot of duplication of very important uh, government officials? Thank you. Just very quickly, I mean, SMEs are uh, critical to the TPP story and to uh, um, trade with Asia, trade in Asia. Um, majority of companies are SMEs, and they uh, typically have not been as included in the uh, story of trade, investment, and uh, economic integration in the region. There is a chapter of TPP, as I understand it. Uh, actually, I don't have to understand that. There definitely is a chapter on S SMEs, according to the, um, the White House uh, release. Um, and I think that the purpose of that is to try to get SMEs more integrated into trade investment and supply chain channels in the region. What the specifics are, we have yet to see, but it's, it's critically important. And all of these organizations that I've talked about have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get SMEs more into the conversation. Um, 37 dialogues, I think it was, not agencies. There are probably more agencies, <laughs> if you, depending on how you define agencies, in these different dialogues. But your point is still well taken. There's probably too much, and some of that clutter could be removed. But I think we could identify enough. each of those things is helpful, though, and, and probably not that expensive to run. So I don't think we have to throw things out just for the sake of saving money. I think you know some of these things could be useful in their own low-level way. But I think we should be choosing you know four or five priorities and trying to really focus our attention and resources on those issues. And some of the issues we've talked about here today are the candidates I would choose. TTP for Japan. Uh, I think it's a good stimulus to the working younger population. 
and uh, like uh, Ambassador Tong, I really want them to be competitive and going to abroad and, and earn the money uh, in order to sustain our aging society. And uh, without this, uh, we can't sustain. Uh, you know, we can't sustain aging, uh, the uh, pension system, and the medical cost. So uh, this is a good stimulus, and I really want the younger generation to, to go out uh, outside Japan. Uh, through over gloss, uh, this is everywhere. But as long as we know the individual country's sources of growth. Uh, we can uh, look at it and, and uh, uh, the, the, the continue to build on the quality infrastructure and uh, with also not losing sight of the importance of the education and the health. Uh, uh, we are aware of all these points and, and uh, so the important dialogue with, among the partners, uh, uh, including the multilateral, bilateral, uh, is the way to go and uh, we are uh, quite committed to, 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 to move this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're on the uh, time to stop. Just one more comment on the small and medium-sized businesses. There is very well-known Petri study that you know estimates the gains from trade, but I think people are not aware about what are the pathways to get those gains from trade. There's a foreign direct investment increase. There is expanding the role of existing exporters, and they find that the most powerful way to generate gains in the TPP is actually by enlarging the circle of exporters. Uh, that means to bring more small and medium-sized enterprises into the uh, uh, international trading uh, operations. Um, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful discussion. Please join me in thanking all the panelists. Thank you.